Hi everybody, thank you for coming. My name is Lisa and I'm here to talk to you about the topic of adult children of alcoholics. If you're here, it's probably because you are familiar with this book, Adult Children of Alcoholics, by this woman, Dr. Jan, who was my mom. And she passed away in 1994 with a lot of work left to do. But while she was here, she laid down for us a beautiful foundation for healing. And so I feel that it is my job and my responsibility to share her work with you and to also share what I have added to that foundation to help you move forward. So let's begin. Okay. So who are we talking about here? So many people relate to the characteristics that we're going to be talking about. You don't have to come from an alcoholic home. You could come from so many different uh, backgrounds. We have found in the past that people that come from ultra-religious backgrounds, um, army brats, all sorts of people relate to this. So if you, if you relate and you think that it's helpful for you, come on in and, and please share, share with anybody that you think this work might help. So here it is. We, we refer to, this is a quote by Dr. Jan, but we refer to them as adult children because though they are chronologically adults, because of the environment that they were brought up in and the fact that they have really had to bring themselves up, in some areas of their lives, their maturity level is more like that of a child than of an adult. So there's an adult that became an adult too soon in some ways, and a child that didn't have the parenting they needed to develop in other ways. I'll give you an example. Many of us were little crisis managers when we were kids. Maybe we ran our households. And so, you know, we, you know, we, we had to. We had to run the show and we know what to do in an emergency. Many of us have grown up to have careers in working in crisis environments, which is great. But the problem is as a lifestyle, you know, it has its limitations. So whereas early on, these are survival skills that are really necessary and adulthood doesn't really work so much. So that's one example. Another definition that I want to talk to you about is the definition of the word codependency. This word is so overused, I don't think it means anything anymore. Um, if I love you and I'm there for you and I'm attentive to you or, or you're attentive to me, that, that's not necessarily codependency. It could just be love. Codependency happens when my life revolves around you. And when my relationship with you has all of the qualities of any other kind of addiction, the physiology gets going, it's that stressful relationship, it's the push-pull, it's knowing that you want to quit that person and you just can't. And then you go back and you kick yourself, just like promising to quit tomorrow. Same exact thing. So that's what codependency is. It's when your life is consumed by another person. Just want to get a couple of terms together so that going forward, we're all on the same page. Um, I want you to know that this is a place to visit. It's not a place to live. We have always felt that this healing process is largely educational. It should have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and then off you go. Now, there's a caveat to that. Many people have had trauma, and all of the talking about it in the world will not help it. It will, if anything, it will entrench us in that pain, and, and we become committed to that pain sometimes because we don't know who we are without it. That's our identity. Um, however, um, if there is trauma in the background, that's a separate situation. And, and you really, um, you really want to work with a healer who knows how to work through that. Um, and, and that will help you get through that block. Um, other than that case, and, and, and many people have to do both. 
and and that's a great combination. Um, painful, yes. Is it your fault that you're left holding the bag like this? No, you didn't ask for it. What you went through, children shouldn't go through. But it is what it is, right? So while you're not responsible for the fact that it happened, we're responsible. We're responsible to to do what we need to do to move on. And the good news is, is that because we've had such a depth of pain, we also have a depth of experience that we can use to help other people and really have a a, a, a very meaningful life. We're, we don't tend to be shallow people. So that's the good news. So it's a place to visit, not a place to live. Now, the support groups that you've been going to all of these years, I want you to know I'm not affiliated with them whatsoever, and neither was my mother. Back in the day when this all started, yes, we all worked together. But the organization that sponsors the meetings that you've been going to for decades now, I want you to know, um, because it's a fact, that those meetings are designed for you to continue to go really for the rest of your lives. I actually have, I don't know where it is right now, but I actually have an anniversary coin from these ACO, this ACA uh, group. Um, and it's a 40 year coin. There is no way that we should be talking about this for 40 years and certainly not celebrating about it. Um, that's not okay. That's not okay. Being the adult child of an alcoholic is not who you are. It just identifies your experience. And that's that. So it's not really a title. It just describes what we went through. And, and the reason why we, um, we need support is because we have been trying to make sense out of crazy and we can't do it. So here's the key. The key is you don't need your story anymore. And people get very frustrated with me because I don't want to hear the story. I don't want to hear my story either. It's been told so many times. We don't need the story to move forward with our lives. What we need is to understand the way we feel inside about what we've been through. How has it left us feeling inside? And how does our past experience continue to impact our lives today? And once we have that all figured out, how things continue to impact us today, not only do, are we 75, 80, 85 percent of the way home, but guess what? You will be amazed to find that the reason why you are still resenting your parent or parents all of these years is because what happened is still impacting your life today. And when we start to take the steps to do something different into the future and begin a new history, that's how we solve the past. And you will see that you're not so angry at your parents anymore because what happened back then isn't affecting you the way that it was. So that's sort of the key to success there. And that's the exciting part of the work. You know, it's painful and it's hard, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it. So we've, we're going to get some good stuff done. So what do I want to say to you? I had asked for you all to please submit questions to me, um, for me to answer. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is because it kind of gives me a place to start and a feel for where people are at and what you all are needing. But also, I don't know about you, but when I'm in a lot of pain or have too much going on in my mind, I can't settle down and focus. And so I wanted to know, like, what are you hurting about right now? And what do you need to kind of clear out? What do we need to clear out the room of before we can settle down? So I have a nice, I have a beautiful list, actually, that I'm going to go through in the next video. Um, but for now, I just want to answer one question that I think is really, really, really important. Um, and then, then we'll say goodnight and go on our way until the next time. Okay, so actually, actually, you know what? There's two questions. One, 
is that somebody asked if my mother was the adult child of an alcoholic. And people ask that all the time. Part of it is because, you know, we want to know that the person that's helping us has been through what we've been through. Maybe we think they can't help us if they haven't been through it too. Um, in my mom's case, it wasn't that her parents were alcoholics. It was that her children were children of alcoholics. And she really, she was so intuitive and so, um, so observant. And she just, she saw it. She saw that we were struggling and she knew that what was happening to us was, was going to hurt, was going to carry into adulthood. So she set out to make it her life's work to figure out how to help. And in the process of helping her own kids, she helped the world go figure great thing. So no, she was not the adult child of an alcoholic. I mean, trust me, her family was every bit as screwy, but in, in, in different ways. So that's mom. Um, the question that I want to answer um, was from somebody who wrote in and asked about no contact. And this is an approach to handling toxic relationships that I don't know personally I've been hearing about I guess for the past 10 years or so. So going no contact is about that toxic malignant person that um, continues to traumatize you and you feel that the only way to handle that relationship is to rip that person out of your life and be done with them forever. So that really, in essence, they're dead to you. Here's the thing. If this is a person that really, you can cut them out of your life like that, and you know in your bones that that person needs to be dead to you and never have anything to do with you again, okay. Okay, that's the way it is. I find that usually that has to do more with a romantic relationship, sometimes a friendship. Um, uh, uh, those those have more success of this no contact approach working because it's somebody really maybe you never should have been wrapped up with them in the first place and so even though maybe you love them very much even though they've messed you up um, that process let me tell you it's gonna hurt I mean, it's going to hurt anyway, but it's going to hurt. Just like breaking any addiction, you're going to go through withdrawal. You're going to go through all sorts of emotions. You're going to feel like you're being boiled alive until eventually you'll start putting one foot in front of the other. And sometimes that works. But in my humble opinion, when it comes to a parent, I just, I just don't... This black and white thinking, you know, you've crossed me and you're dead to me. Yes, I mean, some of our parents have done absolutely deplorable things. If you if you knew the sorts of things that went on in my household, you would you would not blame me for never talking to my father again. I used to wish he were dead. I, for a long time, I wished that he were dead, and I did not have any contact with him. Uh, but comes a time where there is a need for a relationship. Here's the thing. First of all, I like to think that I'm not the only person that wants to grow and evolve. I like to think that everybody is, is doing that, including my parents. And in my case, that was the truth. Um, you know, my father got into his recovery. He's now 45 years sober, 82 years old. He's not that same person. He's not. Now, I can hold on to all that anger and I can keep that same image of him in my mind and never be able to have a relationship with him because of it. But how does that serve? How does that serve? Life is short as we are learning right now. People are dying left and right. And, you know, it could happen to you. It could happen to me. And I just hate for anybody to have anything left unsaid and and uh, leave leave a, a love and a relationship on the table like that. Um, you know, a, a broken relationship that could have had some kind of closure. Um, in the case of my dad and I, we have a great relationship today and I'd be lost without him and I worry about him and, and um, 
you know, we, we're, we're great friends. He's, he's my confidant, one of my, one of my confidants. So, so the thing about no contact with a parent is that it closes the door for any kind of reconciliation, for any kind of growth. And I feel that the chances are so much higher that this pattern will be repeated into the next generation. I want to, I want to ask you to open your mind and your heart to the possibility of things getting better. That's why I wrote Unwelcome Inheritance. That's what this book is about. Break your family's cycle of addictive behaviors. You know, let's open the door if we can. Sometimes we can't. And if we can't, we can't. But you know, we need to learn boundaries. And it is possible that at one point, the boundary might be stay away. That, that's a fair boundary. And you can let that, that parent know, listen, this is where I'm at right now. I need, I'm taking my space. You're not going to be hearing from me. I don't want to hear from you. And I'll let you know when that changes. And if it, when it does, if and when it does, maybe you can make a decision. I'll call once a week. I'll visit for an hour a month. You know, you, you try different things and you find, uh, you know, you find a, a, a middle way you find a middle way. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it does. Um, and, you know, I just, I feel that we should try. I feel that sometimes even the trying to heal the relationship and find a way for it to work is harder than, you know, you're dead to me, <laughs> you know, and that was me. So, you know, I, I get it. I really do get it. But that's the thing about no contact. How can you bury somebody that's not dead? You know, you have a parent that is, that is very much alive. If they're still in their disease and their sickness and their abuse and all that, that's fine. You know, but you can let them know. And, you know, we can we can learn to use our voices. You know, many times people that grew up in, in crisis and trauma, um, you know, don't have a voice. We don't know, you know, everything. We're so afraid of confrontation that to even express ourselves is very intimidating but it doesn't have to be so so we can go from that feeling very intimidating to you to just say what you mean but don't say it mean there's a middle way so that's what i wanted to say about no contact that's the question for the night and then in the next video we'll go through the rest of the list of questions so here's my plan to do that, right, we'll go through the Q&A. And if you have any other questions or topics or things you want to discuss, just message me on the Facebook page, Adult Children of Alcoholics, Lisa Sue and Dr. Jan. It's a long name, but just start typing it in, it'll pop up. Okay, then we're going to go, we're going to get into the ACOA book. Okay, and we're going to go through the characteristics. And oh, by the way, fun trivia. This is the cassette tape of the first uh, ACOA meeting ever in the living room of the house that I grew up in. So this is pretty cool to listen to. And, um, and I also want to just read to you the characteristics that this group came up with um, in the living room. So here we go. I just want to leave that with you and then um, finish up this conversation and say goodnight. So number one, adult children of alcoholics guess at what normal behavior is. Two, have difficulty following a project through from beginning to end. Oh, yeah. Uh, lie when it would be just as easy to tell the truth. That has a lot to do with fear of confrontation. Judge themselves without mercy. Have difficulty having fun. Take themselves very seriously. Have difficulty with intimate relationships. Overreact to changes over which they have no control. Constantly seek approval and affirmation from the outside. Usually feel that they are different from other people. They are super responsible or super irresponsible. Extremely loyal, even in the face of evidence that the loyalty is undeserved. I had a few people write in and say that this is particularly difficult, so we'll spend some time on that. And ACOAs are impulsive. 
They tend to lock themselves into a course of action without giving serious consideration to alternative behaviors or possible consequences. This impulsivity leads to confusion, self-loathing, and a loss of control over their environment. In addition, they spend an excessive, excessive amount of energy cleaning up the mess. So this is the historical list, and the classic list. Um, and I will add to this list my updated spin um, and kind of round round this out. And, and I have a couple of things to add to um, that haven't been talked about yet. So first we'll go here. Then we're going to expand our view. We're going to look at our experience as part of a story that began long before we got here. And by the end of studying Unwelcome Inheritance, you're going to feel, hopefully, hopefully down to your toes, that you are the bridge between the generations of your family and that you can really have an amazing impact on the trajectory of the family into the future. So you can change the future of your family. So that's what I'm looking forward to with you. And we're also going to be talking about um, self-esteem is a big one. Anger is a big one. Um, your sense of self or lack of sense of self and all sorts of other stuff. So I hope you'll join me in the next video. Please like this. Please share it around. If people don't get to see it, it's not going to help anybody. Um, your feedback is always appreciated, and we will see you soon. Be safe, take care of yourself, and take care of the people that you love. And if you're out there doing stuff so that other people can stay home, and if you're out there saving lives, couldn't be more grateful. Thank you so much. See you so soon. Bye-bye.